<clears throat> Mayor, you're muted. Denmore City Council is now in session. And um, this is a special meeting. Will the clerk please call the roll? Councilmember Marshall? Present. Councilmember File? Present. Councilmember Shrebnik? Here. Councilmember O'Kane? Here. Mayor Baker? Here. Councilmember File? Oh, I already, uh, my apologies. Councilmember Kugler? Here. Deputy Mayor Herbig? Here. All present. If you please join me in the flag salute. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right. Next item on the agenda is the approval of the agenda. And if there are uh, no objections, the agenda will stand approved as uh, written um, or as published. Um, next, we have the distinct pleasure of having a new staff receptionist. And our own Nancy Meehan is here to introduce her to us. Nancy, Mrs. Meehan, if you please. Thank you, Mayor, and good evening, Council members. Good to see you all this evening. I am very pleased um, to introduce Christine um, Kabatet. I had to ask her how to pronounce it this afternoon. Um, she is our part-time receptionist. We were lucky enough to get her. Her first day was November 12th. She was working for us. Uh, here she is, Chris. Hi. <laughs> Hi. We got acquainted with her through Apple One Temporary Services. She was uh, working uh, for us as a temp and went through the competitive process. And we was, I was so personally pleased that she wanted to work for us. She's, she's so qualified and so good with the public. You're going to all love her. Um, her normal hours these days are Thursdays and Fridays. I think she would like a little bit more, but for now it's Thursdays and Fridays. So uh, please feel free to stop in and see her anytime. She's, we're so thrilled to have her. Thank you. Christine, we're, we're very happy to have you with us. Would you like to say a couple of words? Um, the only thing I wanted to say was I really appreciate the opportunity to work for the city of Kenmore. It's an awesome community, awesome staff. Um, everybody's been so kind and thoughtful and pleasant to work with. And I really appreciate learning about the, the city and the community and everything. So I, I look forward to getting to know you all better. You're going to really enjoy working with our staff. We have got, I think, the best group of staff anywhere to be found. Mm -hmm. um, we are very, very fortunate to have the staff we have, and we're very pleased to have you become part of that. Thank you. And thank you. Um, next item on our agenda is Housing Development Consortium of Seattle in King County, and is presented by uh, Patience Malaba, Director of Government Relations and Policy. Ms. Malaba, if you please. Thank you, Mayor, uh, and good evening, Council members. I am so excited to be here speaking to you tonight. I do have a few slides to share as we go through this uh, conversation. And uh, City Clerk, I'm not sure if I would have to share from my end or if you'll be advancing slides for me. You certainly have the power to go ahead and, and share your screen if you'd like. Okay. 
Thank you once again. As introduced, I am Patience uh, Malaba, and I serve as the Director of Government Relations and Policy at the Housing Development Consortium of Seattle King County. The Housing Development Consortium exists to serve as an advocate, as a broker, and as a convener um, in the work of affordable housing across King County. We are an association with members who seek to advance housing stability throughout the region. And for the past 33 years, we have served as that convener and advocate, bringing together government, nonprofit organizations, uh, and as well as business partners around our shared vision uh, that all people throughout King County live in safe, healthy, and affordable homes. And we strive each day to ensure that we're creating a more robust and connected sector to better respond to our region's increasing needs that have been exacerbated now, especially with COVID-19. So in going through the slides, I will give you an overview of the housing needs and funding gap analysis that we conducted over the last six months. And then based on these findings, we are moving forward a proposal for a housing levy uh, in east side cities to significantly increase revenue that helps meet our community's needs. Our aspiration is that the housing levy or the housing levies would address the entire affordable housing continuum to support lower income households. And when we talk about lower income households, I often want to underscore that these are people in our communities who are earning a different range of incomes from people who are at zero percent, at zero uh, income that they have and folks who are earning lower incomes as well. So that's your custodial staff who are helping keep your buildings clean to some of your folks who are moderate income like your teachers, uh, your accountants, your biologists in your community, even some of our nonprofit uh, housing uh, people who are doing service provision across the region. And these are lower income households who are struggling to live in east side cities uh, in a period of historic expansion in terms of jobs, in terms of growth on the east side. You also have a once in a generation expansion uh, of the transit infrastructure with some of the uh, stations, at least on the east uh, side, in terms of the East Link uh, light rail stations opening up almost 12 stations by 2023 and 2024. And for you as a city of Canmore, your bus rapid transit that will be opening up by 2026. So having all this investments and expansion and all these trends make the East side one of the most desirable parts of our region to live in. And it gives you a distinct market condition with employment centers, with expansion in terms of economic activity. And unfortunately, that has unintended consequences of leading to rising rents for many and a growing gap between jobs uh, and housing growth, which puts a lot of pressure on moderate income and middle income workers in terms of their ability to live in your communities. So without a bold coordinated action effort, the expansive growth is going to greatly increase the housing costs and continue to exacerbate the displacement especially of long-term residents who have lived in your communities for so long because we continue to see a decline in the supply of affordable housing. And that decline in the supply is of course really underpinned by our continued underproduction uh, and creates a gap and a massive need for affordable housing. So in conclusion, our analysis comes to a place where in understanding what the need is, we conclude that to meet the expected housing need, these cities that you see listed here, including the city of Canmore, would need to collectively produce 62,000 affordable housing units uh, for folks at zero to 50% AMI by 2044. And if we include the 51 to 80% area median income households, that brings us up to 90,600 in order for us to meet that need. And I can talk about the specific number for Kenmore as a standalone city, that's 2,314. 
uh, additional units by 2044. And if you're including the 51 to 80 percent, that that includes uh, 600 more units in order for you to meet that need for folks at lower income. And CAMO currently has a gap. You see here the gap that we concluded was 18,000 for all the for all the cities that we included, uh, but specifically for Kenmore, that's about 260 units uh, by 2044 in order for you to continue to meet the need. But despite this deep need that we see in communities, what we when we look at trends over the last decade we continue to see the market not produce affordable housing options for folks in the lower income uh, tiers. Newly constructed units between 2010 to 2020, a total of almost 18,115. And of all these, 12.7% is what makes up affordable housing options. So those are the options that are at the zero to 80% uh, area median income. And when you compare that with the preserved units, you will see that uh, the preservation options actually allow folks to stay in place and that they are also at 100% affordable to folks at a lower income. And that's mainly because there's quite a number of funding sources from tax exempt bond financing and some low interest loans that have been made available by some of the larger employers. Uh, like Microsoft and Amazon and supporting some of those preservations. So preservation is a key part. Uh, creating new housing is also a key part of the strategy. And when we look at our annual production overall in that period, you will see that we're only producing about 378 units per year. And if we are to meet the need that is in our region, this number has to dramatically increase. It has to increase according to our calculation to 3,487 if we are to meet the overall uh, ambitious need that we have set for the region so far. And I did not include uh, the specific constructed units here for Kenmore as a standalone, but I will note that according to Costa data, there's about new uh, properties that were created in that time run uh, for Kenmore, about three properties that were built uh, since 2010, and what we were not able to ascertain if they were uh, just affordable based on rents, but we know that some of them were inclusionary units. Uh, so some of them are affordable. There were also some tax credit projects as well, uh, closer to that timeline, but we can follow up with specific data that's standalone for the city of Kenmore. But moving on to talk about the revenue question, we also sought in our analysis to understand what revenue the jurisdictions had in that same time period or closer to that time period. So between 2011 and 2020, we note that the cities have about $89 million that's available per year, and that is a leveraged amount. So it's an amount that includes both local options and also uh, state and uh, federal funding altogether. So it includes quite a number of sources here, but what it does not include is funding from HB 1406, which is a sales tax credit, and the sales tax that was established to House Bill 1590, uh, because a lot of that funding has not uh, been deployed so far. But we also looked at the overall housing need number that I mentioned earlier and calculated how much we needed to have in the market in terms of funding in order for us to really meet the need. And according to our analysis here, we would need about $1.1 billion per year. That's inclusive of leveraged funding in order for us to make sure that by 2044, we are meeting that uh, 90,600 unit count number. And given that's a very aspirational number, but it's important that we're working towards meeting that gap. But we also wanted to understand what the gap was in terms of that uh, ambitious number of what we should be having, which is 1.1 billion, subtracting what we currently have, which is the $89, billion, uh, the $89 million per year. So to understand that difference, we have a 931 revenue gap, which we should be working towards per year as the six cities in order to make sure that folks are uh, able to find housing that they can afford. 
And if I can speak specifically to Kenmore, what the aspirational number would be in breaking it down, Kenmore would need about $39.8 million per year to meet the countywide affordable housing need by 2044. So simply put, we have a lot of work ahead of us. But I will caveat just a few things about these numbers is that we are looking here at zero to 50% area median income because a lot of the funding sources do cut off at about 50 to 60% when you look at light tech uh, and the main tools that are used in creating affordable housing. So that's one major factor for you to be aware of in looking at these numbers when looking at zero to 50% area median income when we're talking about the revenue specific uh, needs and gap. I kept this slide here to just emphasize some of the numbers that I shared throughout the slides, um, where I talked about the housing uh, needs for Kenmore specifically, that's 2,314. And annually, in order to get to that number, the city would have to produce 136 units per year. Uh, and the current gap that you have is 260 units, uh, especially at that zero to 50% area median income. Uh, and in order for you to produce or get a sense of what would be the cost of production per unit, it is 430,000 is the number that we're operating from. And if we're using that number to calculate where you need to be in the future, you would need $39.8 million per year in order for you to meet uh, the overall ambitious goal that we're setting here. So given that that is a massive number, uh, we know that it is far much bigger, but we also know that the need in our communities is so massive. Uh, but I think what's more important is that our collective Im imperative is to do what we can in our positions to really advance solutions forward. Uh, this analysis is not meant as a final answer, but it is rather a reminder of the challenges that our communities are facing and a call to action to increase revenue uh, for affordable housing. We know that there are a number of tools to address affordable housing concerns, but one of the ways that we know are effective, especially in the lower income rung, is just the need for deeper subsidy. It's the need for funding, not just for capital purposes, but also for services and operation that's necessary for those units to be in effect. And one tool that we know to be effective is a housing levy. A housing levy can be the foundational funding for affordable housing in a city to support lower income households and moderate income households uh, whose housing needs really, as I just mentioned, require deeper subsidies. And it must be, of course, supported by voters. But I wanted to bring up the RCW here as we make a case for an affordable housing levy RCW 845205 uh, gives the authority to cities to run a housing levy of up to 50 cents per thousand dollars of assessed value. And this has been a tool that has been effective. We've seen this work in the city of Seattle. We've seen this work in uh, Bellingham. And we have proof of the effectiveness of a housing levy as a tool. But I wanted to also give you uh, a sense of where we are in building support for this proposal. So far, we have been in stakeholder engagements uh, effort in talking to different cities, uh, different council and elected officials. And we are at that same time moving forward to the first phase of seeing these proposals getting closer to some kind of uh, grounding for an effective finish line. We're building this support by, at this point, uh, doing some fundraising. We're knee deep in the fundraising for this six figure number for conducting polling beginning of, of the year in 2021. And that polling is going to help us understand the thoughts of different residents across the east side cities. We're considering options of either a block of large contiguous cities all large cities and small cities together in order for us to understand the different opinions across the region. 
there are quite a number of key questions for the poll, but one of them has been the question of, of if this should be a region-wide effort, but we are pretty much very much in support of local jurisdictions advancing your own levies, because we know that to be a gap in order for you to be able to leverage some of the sources that are coming from both the state and the federal level. We've also gone ahead and done some research that just to get a sense of what would be the tax burden uh, per household and what would be the potential unit count that we're thinking of in terms of running these housing levies. And this is what we've understood to be some of the impacts that you see here potentially depending on the rates that the taxes will be set at. So with the city of Kenmore, you're looking at a $63.10 impact. This is overall, it's not just for the housing uh, levy, but in terms of the unit count uh, that we would be able to produce, depending on the rates that we're setting here, because you do have a range of going up to 50 cents per thousand, but if we're looking at the 30 cents per thousand and really staying in that moderate level, you're looking at 628 units per year. And over 10 years, that piles up to be quite a number of units that can help us get closer to meeting the need. And then, and these are numbers that are assuming a leverage number at local level of about 70, 75,000 per unit. Uh, currently, historically, if you're looking back at the uh, funding that I mentioned earlier, when you look at how much the local funding is, it has been about 50,000 per unit in each project in terms of leveraged local source funding. And we're expecting with the increase in construction cost that over this next period of time, we will be getting closer to 75,000 per unit. So the amount that would be produced would get us to these numbers. Uh, and we believe that this would be an effective way to really begin to be proactive to getting close to um, closing the gap uh, in terms of affordable housing options uh, for people. And with that, I will close and wrap up and hand over to you, Mayor, for any questions that folks may have uh, and looking forward to working with all of you in advancing this work forward. Do we have any questions? Yes, uh, Council Member Shrebnik. Yeah, thank you. A couple questions, great presentation. Thank you for this. Um, one is around kind of jurisdiction. It, it, I mean, this is a regional issue, right? Which you which you said. Um, so, can you clarify? So, Seattle already has a levy, and is King County at all considering this? Seattle already has a levy. They've had a levy since yeah. nineteen eighty one. Um, does King County have their own? Are they considering? Are they because it could be counties or cities? So that's that's why I asked the question. <clears throat> King County is not yet considering moving forward um, a proposal, but if there's a King County proposal to be moved forward, it would have to be with support from all the cities, and that's where this question mm -hmm. of a region wide tool has come up. And I want to be frank with some of the considerations and moving forward a regional option. The first one being the Seattle housing levy has been a tool that has been effective for the city. And there's concerns, of course, that if we were to move forward a region-wide levy, it has to be the size that does not reduce what they currently have. And it has to be the size that could actually be additive to what they currently have. So it would have to expand on the top of what Seattle has. Do we have that political support across the region to move a housing levy? That's the question that we're going to be pausing yeah. in the okay. beginning to understand, yeah. Okay, and then the other question was on the slide, um, I think it was maybe your second to the last or your last one where you had the um, cost for the 10 cents per thousand. Yes. I don't know if you wanna put that back up, but it, so you had the cost per 10 and then the number of units were per 15 and per 30. So that was a little confusing to me. I assume that if it's per 30, it would be three times the amount that you have as the per 10 cost. Um, is that a fair assessment? And then the other piece of that, you know, 628 units, well, that's great. You know, it's not even close to the number of units needed. So, I mean, this feels, 
you know, potentially necessary, but wholly insufficient. Yeah. Um, so I, but am, am I right on the understanding of the cost though? You're right on the understanding of the cost. Okay. Um, cool. we, Thank you. Yes. Uh, Deputy Mayor. First off, uh, thanks so much for coming tonight. Really appreciate it. Um, my questions were largely in the same area as Councilmember Shrebnik's. I've been firmly of the belief that, you know, I understand that Seattle voters for a long time have been very wary of going, of relying on suburban voters to pass things. And we've seen that with the transit levies. We've seen that with, with the housing levy. But we all know that there's three times as much um, uh, funds to be had if the county goes together rather than Seattle going by itself. And I am, and I've said this to the executive, I've said this to our King, to um, people I know on the Seattle City Council, I've said this to the folks on the King County Council, but we really, the times have changed since the 90s when the suburbs were voting things down and we're not on board with a lot of these things. And we saw that particularly with ST3. I believe that if a good package is put together countywide, that it would pass and we would get a lot more value out of it than having individual cities go it alone, especially if individual cities are all going alone and all doing a 10 year levy and they do it in different years. It makes it a lot harder down the road to get it to the point where the county can go. If we have a bunch of different staggered end dates, it makes it really hard for the county to go. And I think the need is high enough where we do need a countywide. Um, levy of some sort that, yeah, is additive to what Seattle's doing, but also is getting um, buy-in and, and, and is building throughout the entire county. So I really hope that, I mean, I, I, I support what, what you're proposing. I think it's really important and we do need to be pulling all the levers that we have available to us because it is a crisis. There's no question around that. Um, but I would hate, hate us to, I would hate for us to be put into a place where then a countywide ballot measure isn't viable or isn't doable because there's a lot more value I think at the end of the day going countywide and if that means you know maybe a couple cities doing something that only lasts until the end of the current Seattle levy and then you know having that conversation you know when they're all expiring at the same time um, maybe that's not I don't know when the Seattle levy is currently up I can never keep track of their they have like a six-year schedule or something and I don't know where they are on that but I, I really hope that eventually we can go as a region and really address this the same way that we are addressing transit you know we were so far behind the eight ball in transit we're making ma major investments we're way behind the eight ball in housing we, we need to be making the same sort of multi-billion dollar investments as a region so um you know Kenmore doing this would be great it'd be a heck of a lot better if the entire county was doing it and kicking in Councilmember Marsh, go. I'm sorry. Sorry, I, I want to just chime in and respond to Deputy Mayor Habig. I, I really appreciate those comments, and I will emphasize just how this work actually began with the vision of moving forward a collective, unfragmented funding source that's countywide, and that work continues. We have conversations that are ongoing with King County to understand where they would land in this work. We also have conversations with Seattle, so we understand the coordination of their 2023 levy renewal and how it could tie with this effort. So I, I think I didn't emphasize that piece of the work continues to move in terms of conversations. And then there's the other piece of the east side cities facing the expansive growth that you are facing and really calling on you to step up the revenue tools that can be available, whether that's in 2022 or 2023, while we're talking about the regional approach. And then we have the opportunity in Seattle with the new mayoral administration as well for some open conversations. Councilmember Marshall. Oh, I had no question. Thank you. Anyone else? Ms. Malaba, do you have anything else for us? Well, I will close by thanking you and the council for the great work and the prioritization of affordable housing that we've seen over the years. And we really appreciate all of your efforts. Uh, and we hope to be working in partnership with you in advancing a housing levy. 
whether it is within the city of Canmore or we end up with a region, regional option, this is really important work and I do appreciate that this is a top one priority for all of you. It is indeed, we have made that very clear. So thank you. Thank you very much for the presentation. And I'm sure we will be speaking again. Um, next item on our agenda is the consent agenda. Is there a motion? So moved. So moved. Second. Moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, kindly say aye. 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 Opposed? Consent agenda passes unanimously. Next item on the agenda is the amendments to the um, Kenmore tree regulations presented by the Development Services Director, Mr. Brian Hampson and Senior Planner, Samantha Loyak. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Thank you for the opportunity to uh, discuss this topic with you again. I had, we do have uh, Samantha Loyuk with us today, but um, we are here tonight to um, go over our recommended uh, code tree regu regulation amendments with you. Uh, mainly, we want to circle back with you to make sure that we're on the same page, accurately uh, capturing what you wanted us to uh, uh, change on these five topics that we discussed with you before. So while there is no formal action tonight, uh, we do need feedback and direction from you. So if you're in support of what we're proposing or if you'd like to make some amendments, just let us know as we go through the presentation. So I will start the slideshow and then kick it over to um, Samantha. Hi everyone, thanks for having us back. Um, before we get started, well, Brian is actually going to run the presentation. We'll go through it together. Um, and then I'll just kind of speak on, on the different um, topics. But I just wanted to kind of go over where we're at and how, how we got here um, without taking too much of your time. But at the, at the January 8th and 9th, 2021 uh, City Council retreat, there was discussion of tree preservation um, and that was identified as a priority and council requested to conduct an informational tree workshop. And then in April, um, Brian and I provided an informational presentation to summarize the existing tree regulations. And as part of that presentation, uh, we discussed potential code amendments that were intended to promote and enhance uh, tree preservation in Kenmore. So to further Kenmore's urban forest. And so these recommendations were provided in list one and list two. We came back in May at the end of May to discuss list one and two in greater detail um, and to you know, just get your guys' sign off on those and give your okay to move forward. Um, and then in July, we provided, we got, um, we submitted our final proposal for the King County, uh, King, oh, sorry, King Conservation Dif District, KCD, um, 2021 Urban Forestry Health Management Grant. So we applied for that. And during this time, we also received uh, preliminary approval to have a tree canopy assessment. And then in September, you heard from um, Garrett, he presented a policy paper and then um, just kind of, and now you're hearing from Brian and I. So we're, we're, we've kind of moved along, you know, throughout the year and are continuing to, to have these touch points on tree discussions. Um, and also in November, I met with KCD and we talked about the tree giveaway event that they are they will be funding. So we're actively working on that. But tonight um, we're going to talk about the tree regulation amendments that we were um, directed by council to move forward with. The, and these are all the items that are on list one. So list one included uh, five different items. Okay. And these items, um, we'll go ahead and we'll go through them. And then you will see as we, as we continue with the slides that, um, Brian, do you want to 
click can through. You, can you see my uh, slideshow? Yes. Mm -hmm. I can see the presentation, but I don't see that you've clicked it like from beginning. You should click from beginning. Oh, I'm sharing the wrong screen then. Let me stop sharing and share the correct okay. screen. You're probably like, okay, Sam, get on it. How can you not? <laughs> But um, so as Brian's sharing that, we, we had five items. Um, number one is to change the definition of significant trees. So it includes smaller diameter trees. So that would provide greater protections for more trees. The second um, was to revise the tree retention requirements to uh, exclude nuisance species so they don't receive any credit. Um, thanks, Brian. And the third one is to codify the tree removal application process for existing single family residences. This is a code, uh, this is a code cleanup item. Uh, and then number four, also code cleanup was to update the removal, uh, the penalty language for removal uh, without permission. So that's for consistency in the code. And then number five, is to reduce the amount of time that permits are good for so that trees get planted into the ground faster. So we'll go through these one by one. So the first one is on the on the left side, you're going to see the current regulation. And then on the right side, we have the proposed language. And the way that we're going through these, we're just going to go through one, two, three, four, five. But we want your feedback so that when we bring an ordinance uh, to council that it is um, as desired, that it's in the correct format um, so that it can be it can be approved. So this will be the opportunity to discuss these five different points um, and what changes should be made actually in the code. And keeping in mind, we have a list too, but that is not on for tonight. We are trying to get through list one so we can get some code changes made. Um, so let's stop after each one of the five and make sure that all questions are answered. Yes, Mr. Mayor, I think that's a great idea. Um, so on the left side here, this is our definition of a significant tree. So I won't read through each one of these, but essentially what this is doing is this is reducing it instead of the eight inch or the 12 inch, it's just saying everything is six inches. Anything six inches um, or greater is a significant tree, which we will have the exception of nuisance species. So with that, we'll open it up for discussion. Deputy Mayor. Is there, Perfect. yes, Deputy Mayor. So could you go over briefly what added protection significant trees have versus non-significant trees? Sure. So once we um, say that they're significant, they become that goes towards your yearly allowance of tree removal on your property. Um, so if you had a tree on your property, let's say you had um, just a single family residence, no critical areas, assuming, um, and you wanted to remove a tree that was six inch evergreen, six inch uh, DBH. Uh, right now, that would not be considered a significant tree, and so that could be uh, that could be removed. It's not regulated. So you can cut down as many non-significant trees on your property as you want. Assuming that you're not in any critical areas or buffers mm -hmm. and that those were not part of a tree plan. So if you were part of a plan development, those are designated. Um, and then, so for single family, yes. How long, like, let's say somebody builds a new development and, you know, it includes a tree plan. How long is that in effect? How long does that have teeth? So what we do is we condition the final plat map. So all of those conditions, it says um, all lots within the short subdivision shall comply with the tree plan on file with the city of Kenmore. And so essentially that makes it a, a hard condition um, on, on the plat map. So that tree has protection for as long as it's going to live or become dangerous, essentially. Okay, thank you. 
Anyone else? Yes, Councilmember Shrebnik. Yeah, my, my ignorance here. Why, why do we care that stumps are retained? Do you want me to ask that, Samantha? Yeah. So sometimes um, trees get removed without permission. Yeah. And um, we need to have a way to assess the size of the tree. And by putting definition in here about the size of the stump, it gives us uh, a better, um, um, what do you call it? Uh, evidence of what we can actually um, support. And so if somebody was to cut down a uh, significant tree that barely met the, uh, the uh, size to be a significant tree, it's really hard to prove it once somebody's cut it down. And so if we're looking at the stump and we could say, okay, now we actually have a size for the stump, that if the stump's in place, this is what we'll consider as a significant tree. So it's pretty much after the fact people cut it down, yeah. it a way to prove or not prove to to um, assess, you know, the tree itself of what it was. So this isn't about pres okay. I guess I was interpreting it as significant trees we want to preserve. And then I saw the stump language and I was like, well, wouldn't you want to like put a real tree in there instead of a stump? I, I yeah, so I was struggling with that, but I, I, yeah, so maybe that's explained elsewhere. I don't know. Can I add to that, Brian? So I think that it's, if we've had a, a code violation and somebody mm -hmm. says, well, how do you know that's significant? You yeah. measure it at four and a half feet, right? So we want to be able to, to say we assessed it based on this and it's supported by the code. Otherwise it presents a challenge when, you know, we go in front of the hearing examiner and then we could be challenged on something like that. Deputy Mayor. I guess my point was, so if somebody wants to remove a stump, that maybe was has been there for 20 years i i'm i'm struggling with why that should be you know and they want to put trees in real trees why should we consider that significant so i mean yes we want to enforce the code and maybe we can use this definition to provide evidence that someone just cut down their tree but i i i see problems with it i guess I see what you're saying, um, but I think it's more for trees that have been removed without permission and we were to follow up after the fact. It's not yeah. necessarily saying that you had a, you would consider a stump a significant tree and may have to do some um, get a permit or anything like that. Well, then then yeah, maybe that's if you can make sure that's clarified somewhere else in the code. That'd be great. Thank you. Deputy Mayor. Um, how would how are significant trees are significant trees treated differently when we're subdividing you know a large plot um are you asking are they treated differently for an yeah i mean my, my major yeah my yeah. yeah versus a single because you know a single family can cut down two of these significant trees a year kind right. of regardless yes so um there are two different ways. So single family removal, the yearly is kind of, you use that chart, um, but for development proposals, they have a tree density requirement that they have to meet. So that's 30 tree units per net buildable uh, acre. And so that's a calculation and there's a translation table. One unit is not necessarily a tree. Um, greater units are given to trees that um, are larger. Okay. My biggest concern right now personally is ensuring that we don't have any future complete clear cuts. I, I think even if most trees need to come down for a development, especially a single family housing development, I really think we need to figure out how to strengthen our code in such a way that preserves at least a couple older trees, just to add some character to, to these places rather than having a bunch of saplings uh, plunked down. Um, Cause I know we can't do that currently cause they can just plant more little tiny trees that take forever to, uh, to grow up. But I would really like us to find a way to 
you know, if there are larger, you know, and maybe this is in the exceptional tree discussion that is in list two, but um, I would like for us to find a place to protect at least some of the existing trees when a large plot is 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 um, is subdivided. Uh, that's something that just a personal gripe of mine. And I guess I would like to find a way to protect trees to prevent from happening again what happened last summer, where a large group of significant trees were literally clear cut. So that would definitely be a list two item. That is, um, yeah, that's actually item number two on list two. So that's something that you guys will likely discuss at your council retreat. As long as it doesn't happen again before then. I wanna make sure that um, we've captured council member Shrebnik's concern. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, Samantha, but there isn't anywhere else in the code that talks about the stump and the potentially uh, for defining a stump as a significant tree. Well, there's a definition of a tree. And so in that way, we would know that the stump is not a tree. But in my notes here uh, for council member Shrebnik's comment, I said that we should clean up the language so it's not it doesn't seem like it's claiming that a stump is a tree. Okay, good. I think we can do that. Perfect. Okay. Ready for the next one, Mayor? Yeah, I don't see any further questions on this one, so yes. Great. So the second one um, is goes speaks to development, and so in, currently in the development, um, it does not specify the tree um, credits that you receive. It you could receive a lot of credits if you wanted to retain a cottonwood, would be of equal value um, as you know a Douglas fir tree. And so what we want to do is have. Uh, developers retain good trees that can be there long term um, and to not give credit to some of these kind of nuisance species, which they have their place maybe in other in other settings, but um, probably not for tree retention and, and subdivisions. I thought you were going to say other cities, which I'd agree with you there. No, maybe in a wetland. Uh, Councilmember Marshall. So are cottonwood and alder native? That's a good question. I feel like they are, but there's some that I'd have to I'd have to double check. <laughs> that's okay. Um, th yeah, that's something of a factor in my thought. I'm I'd always felt that uh, the cottonwoods in Canmore were uh, a species of definite value and significance. And then it was only the, the letter uh, or the email we saw from Mr. Uh, Eric Admin, who knows more about these things more so than, than me for sure, um, seeing in them some value in terms of wetlands or around wetlands and other places. So um, I, I don't know, I was interested in his thought that there might be some middle ground between nuisance, maybe giving them some credit or minimal credit um, as opposed to none whatsoever, so that we have some balance of that. That was my thought. Yeah, and if I can respond to that, uh, yeah, they they do have um, definitely a place, especially in terms of you know wetlands and streams and and their buffers. So those areas already receive protections, and as part of the critical areas code, um, mitigation work is often required, which would require um, planting species like cottonwood, and so because they are beneficial for those areas. So I think that the the intention here is to say, you know, maybe for a single family, if it's in the backyard and we just built a new house, like that wouldn't be one that we're saying you're going to keep that one forever, you know, to to get the same credit. Also, so. um, we see it a lot on subdivisions where developers will want to try to use the alderwoods and cottonwoods and cut down a you know a big fir tree that might be 
um, better to save, but they all meet the same definition. And uh, because they want to put a particular element of their um, development somewhere, you know, we see we're seeing cottonwoods and alders get credit, and so this would prevent that. Yeah. And that's like the property owner moves in. They're like, I want to get rid of these. How come you let them save these junk trees? It's like, you know. So this is the proposed language. Oh, sorry. Deputy Mayor. For the source, <clears throat> excuse me, for the source of developments, is the current tree density on the lot part of the calculation or is it just by size and use of the lot? Sorry, ask, can you say that again? Is the current, is the tree dense, let's say you have a big empty lot that you're going to put five houses on mm -hmm. um, and it's got a bunch of trees on it. Is that tree density part of the calculation, the existing tree density, or is it just the size of the lot and what the lot's going to be used for that dictates um, the tree density just needed? Just the size, just the, just the size, size of the lot. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, Samantha, you want to know if this one, we've got anything that's concerning? Correct. Yeah, is there any, any other um, comments on the, the proposed language for item number two? I have a question. Yes, Councilmember Kogler. Thank you. Um, Samantha, can you remind me for the for new development in this situation, is each tree worth one tree credit or do we have any like different levels of credits depending on tree species? So the way it works, it's not one tree is one credit. So the credits, um, they'll say there's a table in 1857 that says if you have a 20 inch DBH tree, that translates to 4.2 tree units, right? So there's this, this table that tells us how much they're worth, but it doesn't say like, but if it's an alder, you don't get that many. It, it just says this size, it's a tree that's you know healthy and good condition. This is the amount of credits. But this will fix that, right? This will remove these uh, these three from receiving any credit. Great. Can I ask a follow up question then? Certainly. Thank you. So then, in um, are there cases where we want where you would recommend keeping cottonwood or alder based off of placement on the land, other than wetlands? where this might be worth some type of credit or unit? Yeah, Brian, you can chime in. I have not seen, I feel like usually all the plans that I see, there are better trees to retain. It's so anytime we're retaining some of these, they seem to come back a few you know, years later that they're now a problem. You know, this is, you know, most people don't want a cottonwood right in their backyard. So yeah, that's, uh, what do you think, Brian? I don't, um, I haven't, I'm not familiar with any um, situations that, that occurred. Did I mess up the screen? Yes. I hit a button on my uh, um, computer. Did I stop sharing? No, no you, you just increased the size. How would I do? Now we got rid of the slideshow. Yeah, now we see your Word doc. Oh, man. <laughs> Maybe stop and start again. We got the agenda item. Yeah, summary. Where is the IT when you need them? We can probably, while you're doing that, Brian, we can probably still keep going with, looks like there's a question. Yes, council member file. Thank you. You know, I think uh, addressing the issue of surrounding nuisance trees is really important for Kenmore's future and for, uh, you know, proper planning, good soil retention, stormwater runoff and um, soil, um, erosion purposes. 
I, I understand that uh, cottonwoods are considered not only a nuisance species, but aren't necessarily native to uh, to Kenmore or our Pacific Northwest uh, re quite remotely. Um, given that they are a nuisance tree, like a holly tree is, um, I, I can't see where we'd want to to encourage planting. So I'm happy to see a, a list of trees that would be recommended on a website, you know, that like a website landing page and a, a list of what not to plant. Um, I think that that clarification for our, our community and tr transparency would be easier to read rather than having to go through code. Um, so I would like to see kind of a two prong approach on the on these issues of our our trees, whether it's significant trees or nuisance trees or recommended trees. And if I, I I'm pretty certain that alder is a Pacific Northwest native tree. So I'm surprised that it's on this list. Is there a reason why? Um, it's on this list because it's it's been I've come across it uh, for other cities and jurisdictions where it's listed as um, as a, a tree that you wouldn't consider significant. And so like city of Seattle has has a list of them. And it's just typically that these are fast growing trees that don't have a long lifespan. And so protecting them can be challenging um, in that aspect. Thank you. So we agreement with uh, number two here. It looks like we are. Okay. Number three. So this is uh, just to codify the process that we have. We are doing this currently because it's our only way to track uh, the how many trees are removed, and so. Right now, a formal ap application, our code doesn't specifically say that, it just says, oh, if you're, you know, this is how many you can remove per year, but there's no way for us to actually track that. So we ask that people provide an application for the tree removal of significant trees, and this would just solidify that. So... I'm sorry, Deputy Mayor. I was kind of curious what the enforcement mechanism or what the, um, I'm curious what the enforcement mechanism looks like. I'm also curious what the um, kind of expectation is. Is this something where we make it known to, you know, landscape and tree companies and arborists and that sort of thing that that's, that that's the, the law for Kenmore and that they need to go get a permit like you know a plumber would or or whatever or is there some other way that we're that we make sure people are aware of this um and comply so in most jurisdictions to remove a significant tree uh you'll need a permit um it's pretty common for landscapers and arborists to say hey you you probably need a permit for this you need to check with the city um, so there's not a lot of surprise unless it's, I mean, we'll have the occasional property owner that's like, oh, I had no idea, which, you know, I, I understand that, but um, professionals removing them certainly are aware that this is a, this is kind of a standard. Okay, thank you. Councilmember File. Thank you. I I think it's great that we're going to recommend a um, a permit uh, for removal so we can track these progresses. Yet when we do have a uh, vacation like we had this year with, you know, property owner here or there who um, aggressively took out trees and took out more, um, depending on the kind of response they got, I, I think we, we need to uh, possibly consider a, a fine associated with uh, breaking the code. So um i can see that we would also probably need to have some sort of socioeconomic um, um bar level uh that could be applicable for a situation 
And I'd want to make sure that we clarify that in the case of, you know, property damage, you know, house pipes or a uh, home risk, um, utility line risk that those previsions are preempted from this uh, regulation. Does that make sense? Okay. Yeah. And, and I am concerned about uh, the two tree a year start. Um, do we have any sort of a plan for a mitigation plan? Uh, if there, there's to be anything more than one, I would think. Uh, I think I, I'm concerned about the starting with two. Why are we starting with two trees? Um, why not start with one? And uh, if more a second tree needs to be removed in a year, there should be some sort of a mitigation plan uh, in agreement with the city as part of the permitting process. Uh, that seemed logical. Um, but it would be a benefit to protecting our tree canopy. I think um, that's the main reason that it's on a future work plan. It's going to take a little bit more work for us to pull that together, put that mitigation plan together and what those could look like. Uh, these were kind of uh, a little easier to pick up this year. So when we do bring back um, the future work plans, we, we could talk about um, the number of trees that uh, can be cut down on single family. We can put that on our work plan. We can look at how much time it'll actually take us to write that kind of code language and other um, uh, parts to go with it. Well, I think that's good. Is that, um, I'm not sure if that's in our part two work on tree canopy or not. It is? Yeah, Thank it's you. item number two on list two. Thank you so much. Council Member O'Kane. And, and this may be tying in with council member files question, and it may be on the mitigation plan um, on the second list. But just in case, as I look at this, the question that comes to mind, and I'm think, I can think of my property in particular, I've got lots of trees on my property. I have a 10,000 square foot lot. Most of it's not usable and has a lot of significant trees on it. But I could easily, in three years, cut down all of my trees at four trees per year. So are we? is there a place that we're going to be able to possibly set a minimum requirement for single family homes or lots? Um, I just, I, I think, especially since we're requesting the permit and you know some form of review with tree removal, maybe there might be a way to say we need to at least keep this many trees. So is there a way to do that? Is this the time well, or the later? I think it is on list two. And I think it's all it's all um, holistic. It's all uh, comprehensive. Um, the the matter and the subject itself. And so those are all the things that we really need to look at when we're putting together this <laughs> this next part. Yeah. But, yeah. yeah. And then. De yeah, so definitely on the next part, I would like to see a, a minimum requirement if, if that's possible. Thank you. That is also tied to list two, number two. Uh, yes, Councilmember Marshall and Councilmember Shrevenick. Okay, and I got to thank Mr. Admin again for noticing the proposed language. I do think there needs to be an active, uh, permissive language, an active verb somewhere in there, but it would work right after removal of significant trees. It probably should say something like removal of significant trees is allowed on lots that contain existing, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then at the end, you've got provided that an application shall be filed. So you got to have a verb somewhere, somewhere in there after that, but please consult with the city attorney or otherwise, but I know you got to have a verb in there. I agree with him. Thanks. Councilmember Shrebnik. Yeah, I had that same thing um, to flag, except I had one other thing and now it's gone in my mind. It'll come back, sorry. <laughs> and, and I guess I, I'm concerned that somebody could clear cut a lot over a period of time by removing one or two trees a year. And, and I sure don't wanna see that happen. 
but that's probably on the list two also. It is on list two and I, I, rem I, I remembered my that. comment, sorry. Um, I, I think Samantha, you talked about um, uh, tree cutting uh, companies kind of knowing that permits are required. And I mean, my impression from talking to a number of them over the many years we've been here is they largely defer to the owner to take care of that, so to speak, to take care of it. And so I, I would not, I, yeah, I think there's education that needs to happen both on the business side and the community side. I don't, I do not agree that this is known. Anybody else? Oh, council member file. Your hand is up. Councilmember Kugler. Thank you. Um, just to add to what Councilmember Marshall was saying, like I, I think this whole thing needs to be simplified. It's really hard to follow and um, get to the to the real meeting. I think there. I think that entire clause that was ended at the end is just very confusing to follow along. So, I think it needs to be rewritten and simplified if possible. Anything else? So are we in agreement with this then? All right, we will rewrite it. Yep, I've, it made, I've made some notes to, um, to simplify and, and to clarify it. Number four. The same content. Okay, number four, here, here we go, making progress. Okay, um, so this is to update the tree removal penalty language. This is, um, we'll refer to this to you, but our, we are, I think the highest um, that, I, that I've ever seen for tree removal penalty. We were advised um, by the hearing examiner, I think once or twice even, um, that these that our fees were too high on this um, and so this was a cleanup item for many years and i open it up to uh, discussion discussion comments suggestions Yeah, you know, seeing some of the things that have happened over the years, I'm very happy with keeping them high. Uh, Councilmember Kugler. Thank you. Um, I'm wondering why um, the proposed language is maybe assessed a monetary value up to instead of that they shall. Is this like how will we determine the amount? And why is it like maybe you might be charged it? instead of you will be charged it. Brian. So as Samantha was saying, um, it's this number um, is difficult to really get a, a judgment on uh, in our favor all the time, unless it's really onerous. You know, we, we had a, a situation a couple of years back where a homeowner cut down some significant trees without a permit to increase the value of his, you know, of their property, you know, and so it was obvious that you know the the cost that they actually had to pay for the uh, uh, the um, penalty was not even you know as much as they increased the value of their house. Whereas if you had, um, as Council Member Shrevenick mentioned, uh, a tree cutter who came out and didn't inform a particular family or a person that there was a tree that needed to be cut down and it wasn't uh, increased for certain reasons. It didn't have particular reasons with it. Maybe it wasn't um, um, as big of a deal, if you will, one that they could have gotten a permit for if they would have just come in and talked to us. It seems um, it's higher, it's harder to get those judgments on those particular properties um, to say that's the same, you know, the price, the penalty is the same $2,000 for the um, 
into the tree. And so there could be a situation where we could have a little bit of flexibility with the homeowner, depending on the situation that they're encouraging or, or encountering. But there is a uh, not to be reduced to an amount less than five hundred dollars um, for the violation. So it's leaving a little bit of discretion um, to the city um, on that that side of it. Uh, Council Member Shrebnik. Yeah, I, I, I am can kind of concurring with Council Member Kugler as, as, uh, as I'm seeing it now. You've kind of got a double out there. You've got May and up to, and I don't think you need both, right? You, may, you might need the up to to comply with the court, but I don't think you also need the May in there. And I think that's confusing because that suggests there's other criteria that you're going to use to assess any fee, any fee at all. Um, so, and I don't think we want that. Council member file. Thank you. So I, I also concur uh, in the confusing language that would be hard for uh, residents to likely interpret and um, when I'm looking at the proposed language, I think it needs to be cleaned up. I also would recommend that if we started with a first violation of $500 for a, you know, significant tree of six inch diameter, right, um, then the next corresponding violation, if a second violation was to be uh, issued, should be double than that of the first much like when you you're getting a um a ticket violation in, in court <laughs> you know if you you go in once it's five hundred dollars you go in twice it's a thousand dollars um i think that's fair and it also you know shows there's a significant penalty maybe something that would cause pause but um as we don't have a landmark tree case um you know, I would want there to be a penalty for landmark trees when we get to the second phase um, for removal without permit. Anybody else? Council Member Marshall? I'm wondering with the idea of giving you more flexibility before the hearing examiner then, or whoever was decided when it was said shall be, you know, 2000 and not the up to no flexibility. Did the decisions then or the decision maker just blow out the 2000 and say, okay, it's nothing. And thus you really do need to have this flexibility or did they reduce it themselves or can they reduce it themselves? The decision maker, the hearing examiner or the judge, whoever it was. That particular case uh, was settled. And so uh, we formed a settlement agreement with um, the, the city and the uh, property owner and uh, took it out of the uh, hearing examiner's hands. Uh, but he, or he or she, the hearing examiner would have had to stay with that $2,000 per inch if it wasn't for the settlement agreement. There was a case that went to the hearing examiner longer ago. It was, um, I don't know if you remember, Brian, it, it was a code violation and it was a developer that removed it when we said, don't, don't remove it. <laughs> and they did. And then we did charge them the, you know, whatever was calculated in the code. And it was a really large fee. I wish I hadn't remembered the number, but it was reduced at least by half um, by the hearing examiner. And they ended up paying that to us. Do you remember that, Brian? I do. That was some time yeah. ago. Uh, I don't remember the details and I don't remember the amounts. Yeah. But I remember the case. Yeah. Anybody else? Have you got uh, what you need on this one? Well, we've had some discussion on it and I can uh, clean up the language. It sounds like remove may um, because that's you're kind of saying it twice and you don't need that. And that it's could be maybe a little, so clean up the language that it may be too confusing in that area. I don't know if we got a consensus on the amounts because I know Councilmember 
member file was talking about like almost like a tiered, um, you know, penalty. Yeah. Uh, and that's not what is set up here. So I want to make sure that going forward that, you know, the amounts that we have in here are what is approved. Well, I can certainly see a tiered system. You do it once, one thing, you do it again, you're going to pay more money. So, I mean, I certainly don't want to play around with these people. And there's a lot of thumbs up on that. I see that. Okay. That makes sense. I just wanted to make sure before we, before I um, made those edits that we were all um, in agreement on that. So seeing that it. Oh, I'm, but we're, we're certainly. Okay. A lot of us are. <laughs> Council member Kugler. Um. I'm in favor of giving the staff the flexibility they need in these situations to figure out like what you think is right. But I also worry about when policy is so flexible that staff don't know how to proceed. And I wonder if this might be the case when we're saying a monetary penalty up to $2,000 per inch in diameter. Like how will you know if you're gonna charge someone 500 per inch or a thousand per inch or 1500 per inch or 2000 per inch? Like, is this, like, do we need to refine this part a little bit? So in, in response, okay, I'll just say something and then over to you, Brian. But I just kind of wonder, is it like, how egregious is it? Because we've had an instance where we're like, in writing, we said, developer, you can't remove these, right? We're, we're, we're actively removing, we're actively reviewing, excuse me, like a permit. And we're saying, don't do it. Make sure you don't do it. You have these corrections, right? And then they remove it. So, I mean, instances like that, I like the flexibility that it's so clear that we're saying, yeah, you do. Versus, you know, a property owner, you know, that's saying, hey, my neighbor has this, you know, view easement. And they told me I have to remove this tree. And then I removed it. And now I didn't know I couldn't, I could remove it. Um, so it just, it, it's across the board, but yeah, go ahead, Brian. Uh, no, that was well said. Like, um, I don't have anything to add. Council member file. This is where I think um, additional language would be helpful. Uh, so if you, you had a, you know, significant tree and then, um, you know, kind of level, and then you have a, you know, like landmark tree uh, level. I, I think having um, some hard hitters and some clear benchmarks is making the the code a would be make the code a little easier to apply and read, um, as well as the what we had already prior discussed with the tiered system. I think anything you can do to um, just clean it up so it's not going to be hard to reinterpret because we know that most courts when people go to challenge something is oftentimes a, a judge will reduce um, a fine fee or penalty down to 50 percent so i'm thinking about that on the long term and thinking about you know what our developers are thinking or the property owner who, who doesn't give a darn and is happy to pay, you know, $2,000, $10,000, 40 K. Right. Um, Cause that can happen <laughs> where they're so motivated. They don't care what the penalty is, is worth it to them. I think it, we have to make it sting and we have to make it stick. So uh, I think cleaning up the language, if we can apply benchmarks, I, I think that would offer clarification uh, to help us stick. Anybody else? We okay, okay on this, Sam? I think I have what I need. Okay. Number five. Okay. This one's pretty straightforward. Um, so we would change the the amount of time that tree permits are valid. Right now it's two years. So you have two years to essentially remove it. And then if there are conditions to replant, you have that whole time period um, versus the proposed language being one year. Okay. 
Is there any discussion on that? No, I think one year is good. Okay. And that got us through all five of them. Well, I want to make sure I got others on the on the council that agree, not just me saying one year is good. Well, I did see a thumbs up, but you're right. You're right. right. Let's get a okay. few more nods. <laughs> we got a few more. Okay. So what um, our plan moving forward will be to, um, sounds like, to make some of these adjustments and then bring forth the ordinance since it's pretty clear, um, you know, I, I've taken notes on it. So I feel like I can make the code language and, and get it back to you guys. Okay. All right. All right. Well, thank you. All right. Thanks okay. everyone. Oh, thank you guys. Um, you're clear on everything, right? Okay, tis the season, Sam. You go back being the director of fun. Got it. <laughs> All right. Um, traffic photo enforcement by traffic engineer Tobin Bennett. And uh, it's our second time looking at this one. Mayor Baker, um, just wait one second while Mr. Bennett Gold joins us. I just promoted him. Okay, it looks like I'm here now. Okay, great. Uh, give me just a moment to set up my screen sharing. Okay, are we looking at my presentation now? Okay, great. Uh, Good evening, Council. Uh, thank you for having me back. It's been about a month since we last spoke, and I hope you all are excited for the next installment of this discussion. At the November 8th Council meeting, I provided an overview of the program goals and program structure, and most importantly, how the proposed photo enforcement program will be a service to our residents, which increases safety for our most vulnerable road users and provides for continued investment in the maintenance and safety of our roadways while sharing the cost of those programs in a way that is equitable, fair, and consistent with our city's values. Automated photo enforcement was recommended in 2014 by the Ad Hoc Committee on Pedestrian and Bicycle Safety, and Kenmore City Council included automated photo enforcement as part of the 2020 Financial Sustainability Plan to provide a sustainable source of revenue for our existing maintenance and safety improvement costs. Today, I have some additional discussion prepared uh, on questions that came up after last month's presentation. And I also have some discussion on council's comments that were passed along to me in the intervening time. Lastly, I have some new material too, which we haven't discussed yet regarding how school zone hours are set, considerations for revenue and cost estimation, and then a brief overview of site selection and considerations and recommendations. Depending what additional feedback we receive uh, regarding the proposed code enforcement program, we anticipate seeking council approval after a public hearing at the January 24th council meeting. After the photo enforcement presentation at the November 8th council meeting, uh, Deputy Mayor Herbig asked about the proposed fine schedule and about why the threshold speed for a higher tier of school zone speeding was relative to the underlying regulatory speed limit and not based on the fixed threshold um, above the school zone speed limit. I mentioned that this had to do with information about the traffic environment being baked into the regulatory speed limit, and that's true. And I'll talk more about that in a moment, but there were a few other important considerations that I didn't think to touch on at the time. The first one is one that came up during legal review for the recommended changes to the municipal code regarding photo enforcement, including the graduated fine schedule. When discussing vulnerabilities the code may have to legal challenge, our prosecutor noted that if we implemented a tiered system, it could be challenged on the basis of the division between the tiers being arbitrary. That is to say, in the case of setting a threshold at 35 miles per hour for an increased fine amount, the challenge might be that 36 miles per hour is not substantially different than 34 miles per hour. So on what merit is the penalty different? Basing the increased fine amount on the regulatory speed limit piggybacks on the authority of the regulatory speed limit in order to make that threshold for higher tier fines clearly non-arbitrary. This is because the regulatory speed limit itself is not arbitrary, but rather a decision based on engineering review. 
An ongoing review of speed limits is in fact in process right now, and I anticipate we'll have a presentation to council with recommendations regarding speed limits in early 2022, including speed limits on many of the roads where photo enforcement is currently being considered. The second consideration regarding uh, tying the threshold for increased fine or an increased fine to the regulatory speed limit is one that I mentioned before, that when the speed limit uh, is the result of an engineering review, the speed limit contains information about the speeds which are appropriate for that traffic environment. I wanna provide some context to this notion by discussing a few locations, each with uncontrolled school crosswalks, but differing speed limits and traffic environments. I didn't take these pictures myself, but I stole them unscrupulously uh, from Google Street View. From top to bottom, what we're looking at here are the approaches to uncontrolled school crosswalks on 73rd Avenue near Kinmore Elementary, 155th Street, uh, near Moreland's Elementary and 81st Avenue near Moreland's Elementary. These locations differ in speed limit and in roadway classification, and each of them is a pretty typical example of other locations with the same respective speed limit and classification. On our higher speed, higher classification roads, we expect to see more access control, meaning fewer locations where vehicles, cyclists, and pedestrians can enter traffic. The frequency of driveways and side streets increases as we decrease roadway classification. And we need to be aware, uh, and the need to be aware of other road users suddenly entering traffic is one that is reflected in the lower speed limits for lower classification roadways. Channelization and pavement markings are present on all roads and all speed limits and all classifications, though uh, classification, though channelization is uniformly present on all higher classification roadways and only applied on an as needed case by case basis on local roads. The reason for this is that channelization constricts the use of the traveled way in favor of um, motor vehicle travel, while unchannelized roads provide more flexibility for a shared use environment. A shared use environment is desirable on local roads and an unmarked roadway is a clear context cue uh, to drivers that engagement and awareness are needed to navigate the traffic environment. Providing unnecessarily channelization on this, in this environment would encourage drivers to behave in a manner more similar to what is appropriate on a higher speed roadway and having unchannelized roadways is generally effective at helping to encourage lower speeds in an environment where lower speeds are appropriate. When drivers do travel at higher speeds in a low speed local road environment, however, the risk they subject other road users to is greater than if they had the same behavior in an environment built for higher speeds. Environments that are built for higher speeds are also more likely to have features which separate vulnerable road users from motorized vehicles Features such as sidewalks or buffered bike lanes are similar. These sorts of facilities may be absent or less complete on lower speed and lower classification roadways. In a perfect world, we could set the rules for each specific location on a case-by-case -case basis, but given the constraints for defining a system programmatically, using the regulatory speed limit is a good proxy uh, to help account for what the in-place traffic environment might look like. That is, of course, only if we assume that the speed limits are set judiciously Making sure we monitor our diverse traffic environments and set speed limits that are well matched and appropriate is something that is an ongoing process that should be revisited periodically. Again, setting speed limits is a topic for another discussion, but I did want to make the point that there are a lot of moving parts here and photo enforcement is not a change that would be made in isolation of other engineering processes in the city. The last consideration I want to add regarding setting a graduated fine schedule, which is tied to the regulatory speed limit, is that each fine amount serves a different purpose. The lower fine serves as a reminder to drivers to monitor their speed and to make a better effort to recognize and respect the school zone environment when the school zone speed limits are in effect. The higher fine is to give photo enforcement enough teeth to encourage, uh, discourage deliberate reckless speeding behavior. The expectation is that this lower fine amount covers the majority of drivers who are speeding and the higher fine amount is reserved for drivers who are not participating in normal behavior, the speeding outliers. What speed behavior is normal for drivers takes cues from the traffic environment, which is in turn reflected in the speed limit. I want to take a moment to illustrate how this looks with real speed data applying different speed threshold rules to show which drivers are captured depending on where the threshold lies. On the left, we have tool school zones with regulatory speeds of 35 miles per hour. The top one is Juanita Drive near Arrowhead Elementary and the bottom one is 73rd Avenue near Kilmore Elementary. On the right, we have two school zones where the regulatory speed limit is 25 miles per hour. The top one is 155th Street near Moreland Elementary and the bottom one is 71st Avenue near Kenmore Elementary. 
These are the speeds measured during school zone active hours in 2019. The top row are two locations with very poor compliance, uh, dismal compliance, you might say, if you want to be dramatic about it. Uh, but the bottom row is more typical school zone compliance. If you notice that the very first bar contains all the vehicles traveling less than 21 miles per hour, that is to say, all the vehicles driving at the school zone speed limit are lower, then you can guess why I would not call any of these good compliance. Though credit should go to 71st Avenue for being the only school zone with a significant degree of compliance at all. For all school zones, the proposed fine schedule allows for a grace range of five miles per hour. If these two ranges capture all the vehicles traveling through school zones, I would be a very happy traffic engineer and traffic engineers from across the world would come to Kenmore to study our ways. Traffic engineer tourism revenue might even offset the cost of our system not actually generating any real revenue when we don't issue new tickets. But we'll cross that bridge when it comes. Back to reality, if we were to set the higher fine threshold at exceeding the school zone speed limit by more than 10 miles per hour, this orange range is the share of vehicles that would be captured by the lower tier fines. The higher tier fines would be reserved for those traveling more than 10 miles per hour of the speed limit, that is 31 miles per hour or faster. Wanting to drive, maybe our school zone most in need of photo enforcement and also the school zone with the highest volume of traffic passing through it. If the lower tier fine is important to our considerations of economic equity and we knowingly enact a system where 95% of our drivers receive the more punitive fine, then that goal of serving equity is not met. Using this rule would also not serve our goal of providing a less punitive fine to drivers who are only speeding inattentively, which conflicts with our goal of creating a system that feels fair as well. An alternative might be to set a higher threshold. For example, the increased fine amount could apply to drivers who exceed the school zone limit by more than 15 miles per hour, that is to say 36 miles per hour or faster. This appears to be performing better for some locations, that is to say more in line with our program goals, but still captures an extraordinary share of drivers on the way to drive. It may be undercapturing uh, for what we would consider reckless behavior insofar as looking for drivers who are speeding at substantial departure from the pack, so to speak, but I'm more concerned about overcapture than undercapture for the higher fines. What I believe is the best fit is a threshold which takes information from the speed limit knowing that the speed limit reflects the traffic environment that will give behavior cues to most drivers. If what we want to capture with the lower fine is drivers who are inattentive to the school zone, these are likely to be drivers who started out driving at the normal speed for the road and remained driving at the normal speed for the road. A threshold relative to the speed limit appears to capture that pretty well. To echo what I said before, we should also consider that this is being done in tandem with other engineering projects and programs in the city. These studies are from 2019, for instance, and after walkways and waterways projects are complete, we expect to see lower speeds on Windward Drive throughout the corridor. Likewise, our arterial speed limit evaluation is likely to recommend a lower speed limit on Winnie to Drive or on 73rd Avenue or both. If not immediately, then at least a plan to get there. Reducing the speed limit on local roads is also an ongoing discussion uh, and would have implications for this type of threshold as well. A question that was passed along to me in the intermediary time since the November 8th council meeting was how red light violation is detected. We've had a lot of discussion about how to be fair about speed enforcement and fairness is a constant concern for red light violation detection as well. I wanna quickly walk through how detection zones work to give you some context. We don't have a camera at 61st Avenue and 522 right now, but this camera right here is used for detection at Winnie to Drive in 170th, just to give you an idea of what it looks like. It looks a little weird because it's actually a fisheye lens, which is then squished into something that makes sense to humans. On this camera image, we would draw uh, or map our detection zones for various purposes. The camera knows to ignore things in the red areas. We look for pedestrians inside the green areas, and we know that everything in the purple area is inside the intersection. We can track two things, whether a zone is occupied and when something crosses into a zone. We also have more sophisticated equipment that allows us to track individual objects, but that's for other purposes. Here's an aerial image of 61st Avenue and SR 522, less weird looking because it's not a fisheye thing. Um, a detection zone might be drawn like this to uh, find out when vehicles are crossing into the intersection. A primary concern at this intersection are the left turn violations associated with, each, with eastbound to northbound left turn movements. 
the extreme enforcement of this red light violation would be detecting a violation every time a vehicle passes the stop bar when their movement has a red light. We can acknowledge, though, that this does not always happen, and many people who do not endanger other drivers still may pass the stop bar on occasion, and they might even feel really bad about it. A threshold for how forgiving we're able to be, then, is identifying what degree of red light violations endanger or obstruct other road users. We can look at the space in the intersection that can possibly contain the paths of other vehicles which move during the time the left turn is prohibited. If we outlined the detection zone using the area unoccupied by other movements, then this would be the most forgiving border for drawing our detection zones. If this red line were the edge of our detection zones, vehicles not crossing the red line would not even be detected as having committed a red light violation. Oh no, here comes a car. That was a close one, but no violation was detected. Other than conflicting uh, with the paths of their vehicles, the primary reason this intersection was identified as needing red light enforcement is based on the results of a pedestrian conflict study for pedestrians crossing the controlled intersection on the north leg. Vehicles committing left turn violations, left turn red light violations, uh, were found to be generating pedestrian conflicts for the overwhelming majority of pedestrians crossing during peak traffic hours. A pedestrian conflict in this case is when a pedestrian must either move or be hit by a car, and only includes pedestrians who are crossing during their protected walk phase, which uh, during which time the eastbound left turn is prohibited by a red arrow, hence the violation. That is to say, we looked at the number of conflicts during legal crossing and divided that by the total number of legal crossings. We collected data on illegal crossings as well, but that data is not included in our pedestrian conflict count. Most startlingly, uh, we saw that during PM peak hour, 83% of pedestrians experience pedestrian conflicts. Pedestrian conflicts are the most serious event that can occur without generating an actual pedestrian crash, and a high frequency of pedestrian conflicts is an indicator of where risk of pedestrian crashes is high. Having identified this issue, we have an opportunity to address it before a pedestrian crash occurs. We've already made an effort to respond to this issue, in fact. We found that the presence of police at this intersection resolved the issue entirely. However, ubiquitous in-person police presence is not feasible. Instead, there are uh, half-gap measures in place to mitigate this currently. Right now, there's the pandemic, which reduces uh, congestion, uh, but there's no reason to believe that this issue won't return once congestion reaches previously experienced levels. Before the pandemic conditions, uh, we worked with WashDOT to increase the duration of the all red time here. That's the time when every single movement has a red light. We increased it long enough uh, to allow all of the red light violations to clear. Uh, this reduces our ability to effectively time the signals, however, which itself is unpopular in an environment where we are constantly being asked for congestion relief. Um, Council members Kugler and File asked during the November 8th meeting about the warning period ending as the school year began. Um, this is the schedule from last time, just to bring it up for reference, and here we have the end of the warning period. In service of the goal of making this program feel as fair as possible, I think your point was valid that we are likely to catch drivers during this first week of school who are not yet accustomed to anticipating the enforcement zone, especially after the school zones have been inactive for so long. I've revised the program recommendations to include a warning period through the week when the school zones first become active. And uh, furthermore, I'm recommending that these first days of the fall semester be a recurring warning period each school year. I think these changes will be minimally impactful in reducing the safety provided and provide substantial benefit to soliciting public buy-in. One new thing I'd like to talk about um, is how we determine our school zone hours. Uh, Pre-pandemic, our school zone hours were half an hour before the start of school and a half an hour after release. These hours are substantially less than other cities regionally, and we had some of the shortest school zone hours of all the surrounding cities. In order to make sure our school zone hours reflect the hours when our streets are used for school zone commuting, we worked with the schools to determine what campus hours or determine what hours would capture when their campuses were active. Not only within school day activities, but before and after school activities as well, which are common at all of our schools. 
What we found was that one hour, a one hour period before and after school captured the majority of campus activity for all schools in Kenmore, and an additional 15 minute period before and after that hour captured the time participants in those activities would be commuting on our streets through our school zones. This 15 minute period before the start of school also protects, this 15 minute period after the start of school also protects parents traveling home after escorting their children to school or students who are arriving late to class. The same logic is applied when determining the end of day school zone times, except in reverse. And this of course is also adjusted uh, for early release on Wednesdays. This new longer duration of school zone times, which went into effect when the schools reopened this year, puts our school zone times more in line with what we see regionally. The resulting school zone times at a glance work out like this. The exception we'll see here is Kenmore Middle School, which requested an additional one hour afterwards uh, to cover their sports program for which they expect heavy foot traffic for students afterwards. Because Kenmore Middle School starts so early, this extended timeline lines up well with when drivers would expect to see school zone times regardless. It's also worth noting that Kenmore Middle School does not currently have flashers, but they're being installed as part of the walkways and waterways project. So this purple timeline you're seeing here, the long one, uh, is not currently in effect, but is proposed. The odd dock here is our newest school zone, uh, which is Inglemore High. Inglemore High is a mess. It has a very complicated staggered schedule. Uh, some students attend first through sixth period, others attend second through seventh period, zero period is optional. Uh, makes it very difficult to find a one size fits all time for this. Um, this results in more hours where students are commuting. So in conversations with the school, we settled on school zone flasher hours, which are very broad coverage to account for the varying arrival and departure times for both of the staggered schedules. So far, we're actually seeing reasonably good compliance with the extended school zone time. It's honestly, it's better than I had expected. Um, and the school is grateful for the accommodation as well. And we haven't had any complaints about long school zone hours for Inglemore either, which I definitely expected. We haven't spoken yet about the money, but there's a lot of uncertainty uh, and I don't wanna set expectations too high or too low. Uh, we do have good estimates about program costs though, so I'll start there. Uh, the initial cost to get set up uh, is actually probably zero dollars. Um, this does vary from contract to contract, but if we have an agreement to retain a camera operation contractor for several years, they often assume the upfront cost of installing the cameras. Uh, the monthly cost, though, is rather steep, or at least it looks that way absent of revenue considerations. This is per camera, so a school zone is expected to be around $6,000 per month to operate. And that's only during the months that school zones are active. The good news though, is that this is another area where the contractor assumes the risk depending on the details of the contract. The cost of the camera may be set not to exceed the revenue generated. Uh, this consideration is part of the processing. Uh, the next consideration is part of the processing, our part of the processing, which is police review. Chief Moen, after discussing this with other cities with photo enforcement programs, estimates that this burden can fit entirely within existing staffing levels. Lastly, we pay for court services. And although these don't directly come out of ticket revenue, the amount we pay for court services will increase based on the number of notices of infraction we process for us. $35 per NOI is an average across all tickets. Some will cost almost nothing for violators who just make an online payment. And some will be very expensive if they require a judge's time to arbitrate. Beyond costs, there are factors which affect revenue. The biggest contributor to revenue is the number of violations which occur. The number of violations in turn is a function not only of compliance rate, but of just how many cars there are and how many hours enforcement is active. Initially, violations will be at an all-time high because if violations weren't high, we wouldn't be having this conversation. Over time, however, uh, driver behavior will change and we'll see a reduction in violations which occur. Overall, we expect to see a 64% uh, reduction in violations over the long term, which means long term revenue should be estimated at 64% of current violation frequency. Lastly, some people choose not to pay a fine or contest the violation or request a reduced payment arrangement. While these factors are baked into our revenue estimate, and many of them are difficult to estimate, if we look at these possible uh, results from issuing a notice of infraction, we can estimate the frequency, cost, and revenue 
for each possible way an NOI can be, you know, run its course. Um, in the interest of being conservative, that is trying not to overestimate our revenue, we can simplify the problem by assuming all non-payments will be contestations, meaning we pay the court fees and collect nothing, and all fines paid will be for the lower fine amount. From there, we have to estimate uh, rates of non-payment, um, violation reduction, both of which vary greatly um, across locations regionally. We can look at two locations, for example, um, our locations with the highest frequency of violations currently. In a low revenue scenario, this is for Arrowhead Elementary School in Juanita and Kenmore Middle School in 73rd Avenue. Um, in a low revenue scenario, we see under half a million dollars between these locations. In a high revenue scenario, um, with a lower degree of non-payment and a lower degree of reduction in uh, driver misbehavior, uh, we see nearly $4 million across two locations. These estimates are based on real numbers experienced by Seattle for the low revenue scenario and by Lake Forest Park for the high revenue scenario. In truth though, the locations we're considering lie somewhere in between the two. Lake Forest Park, for example, does not have any photo enforcement on arterial roads, whereas we are proposing photo enforcement on some locations which are arterials. We've discussed the need for red light enforcement at 61st Avenue and SR 522 already tonight, but programmatically we have to define how to consider all present and future locations, which may have the need for red light enforcement. Some of these um, considerations are set by the RCW, but it's important to consider that what we're looking at here um, is that the risk is present, the problem is correctable, and that the camera does more good than harm. Red light cameras, when used inappropriately, can increase the likelihood of rear-end collisions without reducing the risk of other crashes, and that is not a situation we want to allow ourselves to be in. For school zone speed enforcement, what we're looking at here um, is primarily the highest risk areas, and that leads us to looking at collector and arterial roads. Um, on low volume roads, our traffic data isn't always necessarily a good indication of risk. So looking at crash areas and crash frequencies in those to allow us to lump them in with the higher frequency areas may allow us to include some local roads in our red light enforcement as well. Uh, sorry, school zone speed enforcement. Exceptions to this criteria, of course, are locations which are not suitable for red light enforcement. We don't wanna do red light enforcement right at a stop sign, for example. I'm, <laughs> pardon me for getting tongue tied schools on speed enforcement, right at the stop sign uh, would not be a good location even if it is contained within school zone. Also for this first round, we have not considered locations where we're unable to collect data um, or school zones such as uh, Simons is the case for this uh, where the school zone was only recently implemented. Simons Road, for example, we can only just now collect data seeing what the traffic environment is like after a school zone violation, after the school zone has been implemented, we don't have any information about compliance, which predates um, the school zone being implemented, of course. These are the sites that were considered uh, for our automated speed enforcement locations. Uh, Wanted to drive near 153rd, 153rd place east of Wanted to drive, um, 84th Avenue, north of 150th Street, 71st Avenue, just south of Kenmore Elementary, 73rd Avenue, uh, near 192nd Street, that's for Kenmore Elementary as well, 192nd Street east of 73rd Avenue, and 202nd Street west of 68th Avenue for Kenmore Middle School. All of these met our criteria. There are some other school zones, of course, uh, but they did not meet our criteria. What we looked at uh, was not just how many violations occurred, but what the safety benefit of reducing those violations would be. Higher speeds presents higher risk to vulnerable road users. And so being able to reduce those violations for our highest speed areas provided um, a greater expected annual crash reduction than reducing the number of violations for uh, lower speed areas. And Juanita happens to be both our highest speed location and our highest um, frequency of violation location. So it's no surprise that the crash risk reduction on, violation, uh, on, on Juanita uh, came out substantially higher than any other location we considered. Following that was 73rd Avenue, uh, south of 192nd Street. Uh, this is also a high speed location and a high frequency location, um, though in order of magnitude less nearly uh, than Juanita. If we were to recommend 
uh, photo enforcement at two locations, these would be the two locations where we expect to see the greatest safety benefit from having photo enforcement cameras active for school zone speed violations. Now, these numbers uh, for expected annual crash reduction, I want to point out that they're very small. And I'm not trying to lie with statistics. I'm trying to do the opposite. This is our expected crash reduction for having photo enforcement active. The important context for this, though, is we're looking at a crash reduction that takes place only a few hours a day and for a space of only several hundred feet long. And when you look at the risk of crashes occurring in such a small time and space window, a very substantial reduction in risk can translate into a very low reduction uh, in crashes on paper. But the risk reduction here is substantial and we have that here as well. Uh, we see an 11% reduction in risk of fatal crashes on Juanita relative to what's present currently and a 7% reduction in risk for fatal crashes um, on 73rd Avenue. That percent reduction uh, is based on our uh, year-round traffic and not prorated by the time these are active. The risk reduction while the time is active is actually substantially higher, but uh, not shown on this chart. This is just a, a mock-up of what our 73rd Avenue um, treatment would look like with our speed feedback signs our advanced warning signs, our cameras located at the crosswalk, and our existing uh, crosswalk indicator signs as well. On Juanita, uh, we have similar treatments of our school zone right here. I, pardon me, I forgot I animated this one. <laughs> uh, and so uh, those would be the two locations where we would recommend our initial photo enforcement be implemented. Uh, that's the information I brought to share. Um, I am ready to entertain any comments or questions from council. Questions? Anybody have any questions here? Yes, council member Shrebnik. Yeah, a couple of them. Um, so two questions. One, one are the crashes that you list there, the annual crashes, do we know kind of what proportion of there's very few? Um, which is, which is a good thing, <laughs> but do we know, you know, if they're mostly during school hours or not, and then you, you might've put it up and I might've just looked away for a minute or two. Um, but the other question is about what is the hours of operation for the camera that is not the school zone one day, the stoplight one. Right. Okay. So, um, the crashes that were used in this analysis were only crashes, which occurred during our previously active school hours, which was one oh, hour okay. a day, 109 oh, days a year. Okay, cool. Perfect. So it was a very small window to yeah. capture crashes. Yeah, great. Uh, regardless, uh, sorry, regarding the red light uh, camera at 61st, I would expect that that one would operate 24 hours a day. I would expect most of the violations would happen during rush hour. Sure, yeah, perfect. Okay, thank you. Sorry, I might have zoned out. <laughs> I, I didn't mention it. Councilmember File. Thank you. So a couple things. Uh, I'm really happy that we're going to have signage uh, informing you know drivers that uh, um, there are uh, you know traffic cameras in the area. But I have to wonder: Are we going to have don't block the box camera uh, signage as well um, for those drivers who like to you know push the envelope a little bit? Um, I would assume that cars um, sitting in the middle of an intersection at a red light uh, would be ticketed if caught on camera, right? Right, that's an excellent question. Uh, don't block the blocks is a very hot topic right now in automated enforcement. Currently, only the city of Seattle is approved for a trial program for enforcing don't block the box. Um, if that program is successful, then it may be opened up to other applications regionally. But while it is in a city of Seattle trial program, it, it's not something that we're uh, permitted to implement here at Kenmore okay. for the RCW. Well, it's definitely something I think in the future um, we might want to look into. At least I would be interested in seeing us look into that scenario in the future, uh, being that that is a problem. And definitely. I see our manager has a, a question. Um, right. Can so I preempt you, Rob? What? Can I preempt you, Rob? Yeah, I wasn't attempting to answer the question. I had I had another. Uh, okay, 
So uh, uh, Rob has actually uh, put me in touch briefly with um, our advocates who are discussing uh, regionally what traffic enforcement should be our lobbyists. And, and we've been we've had an opportunity to uh, give input uh, on don't block the box, uh, as, as well as other types of photo enforcement that are being considered by other cities uh, as proposed trial programs. But it, it's probably not something that we'll have an opportunity to act on um, for several years. Okay. And there is one issue that was not addressed in your presentation, and I think it's probably because it's a, a newer issue, and that's where our courts will be um, having to respond to persons who have um, hardship or social economic um, differences that are, are rather great. And in those cases, our, I understand our courts will be whether they're making uh, payment arrangements or are not imposing a, a fine uh, that would impact the proposed revenue, correct? Right, so um, this is uh, one of the considerations that came up when I discussed the photo enforcement program uh, with uh, Seattle traffic engineers. And they do uh, receive some reduced payments or non-payments for economic hardship um, through uh, similar programs. What I did for our revenue estimates was I conservatively estimated that all of our non-payments would be complete non-payments, as in bringing zero dollars of revenue. So those reduced payments would actually increase the revenue that we expect to collect because currently our estimates have those as zero dollars in the reduced payment category. Thank you very much. And thank you for the uh, excellent uh, presentation. Thank you. Mr. City Manager. Yeah, two things in your legislative agenda on the policy document you did you do have a statement about um, expanding photo enforcement options including the Seattle model to other cities so um, if there's legislation in the next session that's being proposed we already have your authority or your buy-in to um, advocate for those or sign in favor of those um, so Tobin uh, just for a, a process question um, Tonight, you're looking for specific feedback on uh, proposed locations and also on fines, are you not? Yes, that, that would be helpful in, in making sure that we can put this uh, photo enforcement proposal in its final form. Yeah, I'm just very distressed that it's out there in the public that we're doing this for financial gain. Um, and I just, yeah, I've got serious issue with that one. I understand there's the no compliance data is another. Pardon, can you repeat that last? There's no compliance data. Compliance data or enforcement for... data to back it up. Enforcement data, no enforcement data uh, to back up the photo enforcement for red lights or for yeah. school zones at that intersection. So red lights. The, the reason that we don't have any enforcement data for that red light is because when we stationed police out there, they were unable to write any tickets because the problem resolved entirely. So the presence of enforcement itself was completely effective at preventing that issue. Um, I think that the red light, of, the red light uh, detection um, at that intersection is also likely to be very effective. Um, I did not even include that intersection in our revenue estimates because I expect it to be so effective. Any other questions? Any other comments? Councilmember Shrebnik. Sorry, I meant to say this earlier with my comments. Um, you know, I, I appreciate that we're hearing this now, and I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, the next time we hear it, we're going to be asked to um, approve code, um, and that that's going to be at the same meeting where we have the public hearing. I guess my request would be, uh, you know, normally we hear these and we get public comment, and I forgot that we're not gonna have public comment today, um, which I think is really disappointing. So I, I guess if there's a way to have public comment, then time, <laughs> then approval, um, that would be great. Cause it, it just feels like we're gonna get comment, we won't be able to respond and then we're, and then we're in approval. Um, yeah. I'm 100% uh, willing to take uh, process cues from you guys. Um, I've been working out the schedule with uh, John and Rob, and that can be something that we can incorporate in our schedule. Cool, great. 
Yeah, yeah, kind of off the cuff, what I'm thinking is you can have your public hearing in January. I think it would be January 24th with um, code language at that meeting and then final adoption in February. That'd be awesome. Thank you. I appreciate you considering yeah. that. So that would be four touches, which which is great. Councilmember Kogler. Thank you. I have a little bit of feedback and a couple of questions, I think. Um, so first off, I want to thank you for that very detailed presentation and appreciate your, your dry sense of humor and delivery and all of the data. Um, I think the locations, to me, I think the locations make sense. It's supported by some of the data and traffic um, analysis that you've evaluated. I wondered if you specifically wanted some feedback on the thresholds of the different fines. To me, it seems like we're not trying to capture a ton of revenue through this. We're trying to really change behavior, you know, remind people that this is a school zone. I think to the extent that this can protect pedestrians against cars, like this is a good thing for us to do. And if it can decrease behavior over time, I'm all for that. Um, and so I think that, uh, I can't remember the exact options you were giving, but for me, like leaning towards that very last option, I think it was where, where it's a smaller percentage at the higher speed and higher rate to me felt okay given what we're trying to achieve. That's the option I'm recommending as well. Uh, it's the one that is flexible and that it takes into account the regulatory speed limit, which gives, uh, which, which incorporates information from the traffic environment in order to uh, kind of adjust to how people are expecting to use the road. When they're not paying attention to the school zone, they're going to be driving probably according to those cues. Council member file. Thank you. And you were looking for feedback for locations tonight. And um, well, I absolutely can support the locations of Arrowhead and um, Kenmore Elementary uh, locations. I, I really wish we could add a third location of um, Simon's Road uh, up near Inglemore. Um, I, I think that's a, an area that needs to be addressed. Um, but I believe that would be up to council. Um, so I'd like to propose uh, accepting your recommendations of the Arrowhead Elementary location and the Kimura Elementary location. And I would propose adding a location um, of Simon's Road. I definitely agree that uh, Simon's Road is a good candidate for photo enforcement. Uh, the novelty of that school zone right now is my hesitancy for that. Um, I, I think critical to the success of this program is soliciting public buy-in. And I, I would hate to appear disingenuous by implementing a school zone and immediately uh, generating revenue from that school zone. I'm afraid that's what the public perception would be. I believe um, the next summer after we've had a full school year of Simon's Road, and we've been able to determine whether our photo enforcement, not next summer, sorry, a year following the, impl the initial implementation of our photo enforcement program, I think would be a great time to consider the success of our previous two locations, our initial two locations, and consider the uh, addition of Simons Road or any other locations which may warrant photo enforcement. I think that staged approach um, is likely to not only give us better data about how Simons Road is behaving after we've implemented the school zone, which, like I said, is performing better than I expect it to. I certainly do expect that there's a high degree of violations there. Even in our well-performing school zones, we do see a high degree of violations, as I showed on one of those charts. Uh, but having that data in order to substantiate um, our, uh, our need for Simons Road having uh, photo enforcement, uh, I think that will be really helpful in making a, a program that solicits public buy-in. And most importantly, the, the main two arterials that are recommended are part of the throughfare of um, persons who try to escape the, the 522 um, or the 405 uh, fees um, in Patrick fees. So I understand that um, traffic fees um, with traffic cameras are, are very common with people from out of the area. And so if we can help people drive better and safer in our community, protect our community, I'm all for it. All right, any further questions? Thank you. Next item on the agenda. 
resuming in-person meetings, Mr. City Manager and uh, City Attorney. So, Your Honor, um, I'm just back to the photo enforcement. I, I just what we're assuming is we're going to go with uh, Tobin's recommendations on fines. Yeah thresholds and the locations he's recommending i just want to be clear that that's what we're moving forward with on right the, with the public hearing in january okay all right all right so the other item so uh, you know as you all know because of the pandemic we've been uh, meeting 100 percent zoom in city council meetings but uh, a meeting or two ago you brought up the idea of uh resuming um, council meetings in person and Zoom starting after the first of the year. So uh, we looked into it and uh, Don Rayton, our city attorney, looked at um, you know what the governor's orders are and what requirements are if we were to meet in person. So uh, the first thing I'd like to do is turn it over to Don and she can go over those. And then after she go over, goes over the, the governor's uh, requirements, then I can talk about some operational issues. Thank you, uh, City Manager Carlinzi. Um, first of all, I wanted to just very quickly say, woe is the presenter who has to go after such a complete uh, PowerPoint presentation from Mr. Bennett Gold, especially when that presenter doesn't have a PowerPoint of her own. But um, I'm going to instead really provide a summary of what you already have in your agenda packet. So I think to do that, to start, um, I wanna take a step backwards. And as mentioned uh, by, by Rob, is that when you have, you, know, you all know this pre-pandemic, um, when you had public meetings, the state law under the Open Public Meetings Act really uh, regulated how those meetings uh, would occur, the rules and regulations. But of course, it's not normal anymore. And, we are facing still uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. So instead of the OPMA, we have those rules, the COVID rules, if you will, um, that I attached to your agenda or that were attached to your agenda. Um, I will not read those. Uh, those are for you if you have any additional time, but I will briefly go through those to give this council the framework to, to continue the conversation of what an in-person um, meeting might look like in this time of COVID. And just again, those uh, four COVID rules, the first is the governor's proclamation 20-28.14. Uh, the second is the miscellaneous venue venues guidelines, which is essentially requirements for holding business meetings. There is the State Department of Health uh, statewide face coverings order. And then there's also the Governor's Proclamation 20-25.17. Um, as I noted, I will provide the legal framework so you could better understand the constraints. And then Rob will also continue and identify operational uh, aspects of those rules. Um, I would like to note though, that if you see the four rules, there's been many, many versions of them. The first proclamation has been revised 14 times. The last proclamation has been revised 17 times. And I fully anticipate that the rules we discussed tonight will in fact change and evolve depending on the status of the pandemic. So the first um, proclamation, which I believe is the most important to you uh, considering an in-person component, is proclamation 20.8, uh, uh, sorry, 20, 28.14. Um, surprisingly, when it came out, it actually, the general rule was prohibiting meetings. So it wasn't saying you can do this or that, it actually said meetings are prohibited. And then it provided exceptions. The first exception said, unless, um, it is, or they are online meetings. So you can hold meetings if the following components of an online meeting is met. It is not conducted in person and at a minimum, uh, being uh, allowing the public to attend at a minimum, they have to have telephonic access and um, be able to hear each other at the same time exactly what we're doing now. 
But it's very important, you'll hear that requirement echoed in the, the next several rules, which is that the persons attending the meeting, both council and public, must be able to hear each other at the same time. So that's the first exception to the prohibition. And the second prohibition that came out um, later um, in September uh, 2018, 2014 was the addition of the in-person component. So the exception says the council may at its option hold an in-person component in addition to the online. So of course you have to have both. Um, and if you wanna have the in-person component, you need to uh, meet four requirements. Essentially, you have to comply with the miscellaneous venues guidance. You have to um, allow any person who wishes to attend the public me meeting with the in-person component to do so at a physical location. Um, so it, it's either the primary location, a uh, meeting location, or an overflow location. And again, that location must allow all persons to be able to hear each other at the same time. Um, and then if there is an in-person component and something goes wrong, such as the audio uh, online or the in-person component fails, or someone comes in without a mask, that there's a requirement that the meeting be um, uh, recessed and that compliance be restored if possible. And if compliance cannot be restored, that meeting must be adjourned, continued, or terminated. The fourth element uh, to that pro proclamation is essentially what you're doing now is to the extent uh, pr practicable that those wishing to participate both in person and online have the ability to listen and speak through operable uh, telecommunication devices, cell phones, uh, laptops, etc. So the takeaway for that first proclamation, the big umbrella of rules, is that it has to be both an online meeting, it has to be with an in-person component, and essentially all persons need to be able to hear each other at the same time. The miscellaneous venues guide, gu guidelines, which is a requirement of the proclamation, is actually quite easy. Um, it used to have numerous requirements for capacity or distancing, uh, no more. So the one requirement of uh, holding a meeting under that guideline is simply that the city would be required to comply with the Secretary of State Health Order on face coverings. And the, mo uh, the most uh, recent one is 20-03.6. Um, and I'm just gonna go straight into that essentially, and we all are probably very familiar because we do this daily, is that um, Department of Health requirement states that all persons in the state of Washington must wear a face covering that covers their nose and mouth when they are in a place where any person from outside their whole household is present or a place generally accessible to any person who's outside your whole household. So that's the, the general rule. Again, we're all day-to-day -day, uh, complying with that. And of course, there's a few exceptions. There's quite a few in the rule, but I just noted the ones that would be more applicable to a meeting such as um, an exception for eating and drinking to confirm identification. If anybody's been at the airport lately, you'll know that one. Um, if you can't wear it because of an emergency or um, when you're outdoors, except for of course, very large gathering. Um, this rule does not apply to children uh, younger than five with uh, people with medical conditions or persons with disabilities uh, or conditions that would prevent the wearing of a face covering. So again, the takeaway is that all persons at a potential in-person meeting uh, with the Kenmore City Council would be required to wear face coverings and the city would be required to enforce that. And then really the last rule, which is the uh, Washington Ready Proclamation 20-25.17 is, is simply reiterating what I just uh, discussed, 
which is that a governmental entity may not allow an individual to remain in an indoor space without compliance uh, of the uh, St uh, Secretary of Health's face covering order. So you'd be required to enforce that. So these are the legal framework, or th this is the legal framework that applies now, which of course could change. I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have regarding the, the framework, understanding that Rob will next discuss the operational aspects. Did I see in your, um synopsis here that we had the right to exclude anybody that was not uh, vaccinated? So what you would need to do is uh, consider and adopt for yourselves an emergency rule like you've done in other circumstances, uh, creating such a um, restriction similar to what King County has done, of course, with restaurants and gyms, but it would be a legislative act. You don't, you can't just hold someone at the door without an enactment. Councilmember Fowle. Thank you. Um, you know, about that last topic just raised, um, you know, I, I, I believe King County has a King County Public Health has a really good uh, stance on um, kind of the safety aspect of ensuring people are vaccinated or have proof of vaccine of, of a negative test within 24 hours beforehand. It's my understanding that according to the state law um, and in recognition of people's beliefs, uh, that we, we should respect those differences, right? I would wanna make sure that either people were vaccinated or had a, a, a negative test uh, 24 hours beforehand and um, screening on site, uh, uh, they were going to visit the site. Um, so that you know, there is no evidence of a fever when they're walking in the door. You know, we, we have the equipment, we have the, the scanners, um, so we can track if there is a problem. I am concerned about the newest variant and what that means for our community safety at public meetings. This Omicron variant is, it's, it's vicious um, and we're still learning about it. Um, and we're in a, a phase of, you know, as a nation and in our state and our county of, of finding out whether, um, how this is gonna impact us, um, impact our communities, our, our public. And so I wanna make sure and ensure our community is safe attending these meetings. Um, and we won't really know the full impact of our con for at least two to three weeks. Um, so I, I just want to make sure I'm listing this concern and, uh, just driving it home that I am really deeply concerned. I want to make sure that we don't have an, an issue in our own community. And um, I would wanna make sure that equity issues of masks could be provided on site. Um, and the issues of, of people who can't afford, um, you know, like a, a COVID test to, to prove negative uh, 24 hours beforehand. I think we have to address socioeconomic issues to participation government. Anybody else? And if there are no further, oh, I see. Jeff, yeah, I, I absolutely think that we need to require um, vaccinations from the public if we're going to do, go back to in-person. I don't, if you talked to me a couple of weeks ago, I would have thought that we'd be going back to in-person sooner than later. Now I'm a little bit less excited about getting back in-person with everything that's happening. But um, 
but I think it's just the responsible thing to do. Uh, vaccinations are free. Uh, and if you choose not to go that route, that's, you know, that's your decision. You can participate through Zoom or over the phone. Um, there are multiple options open to folks, but right now getting vax is the bare minimum that folks can do to, in my opinion, be a member of our society right now as we're dealing with this. And if they're not willing to do that, then they can participate remotely. Um, I have no qualms with, uh, with us uh, having a VAX uh, requirement for in-person participation. Council Member O'Kane and Council Member Shrevening. Um, a, a few weeks ago, I was with K Deputy Mayor Herbig and feeling ready to come back in person. But then when I understood the logistics of it, and that we have to wear masks. I actually think our expression is important when we speak. It's, it's, it's a big part of who we are and trust. And so that mask, just that we as, as people who are representing our community, I'm all for wearing masks and being safe, but at the same time in our role for us to be transparent and clearly communicating to our community is incredibly important. I. I also um, think what we're doing right now is working. We're getting great community participation, splitting it up. It, I know we can do it. I just don't know that the benefits are worth it. And along with, uh, then we have the new variant concerns. We're going into winter, fall where people get sick anyway. I think erring on the side of public safety, I, 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 prefer staying on Zoom and I did not want to be in this space. I want, I'd want. i like to be in person. I would like things to go back to where they were, but I don't think we're ready yet. So I'm, I, I, and I, I guess it's not any question, but I just wanna say, I'm comfortable with staying on Zoom for, for a while longer and revisiting this in the new year. Council Member Shrubnik. Well, I think everybody's made really good points. <laughs> And um, I, um, you know, I, I feel like we, we could do this. Um, I, I, before thinking about, you know, requiring vaccination cards, I guess I'd want to really find out from staff what kind of position that puts them in. Um, I, I don't feel like that's necessary. I feel like the mask, you know, between our masks, the public's masks, that would be sufficient. Um, but that's just where I'm at. Um, so I, um, yeah, so the main thing was, you know, before considering the vaccination, I'd want to gauge how staff are feeling about that and what that would imply, because uh, there's a lot of complicating factors there. And I don't know. Yeah. I've been gung ho for a long time getting back together. I think we should get back together until Omicron came along and yeah, I think we ought to be waiting a while. That's just my personal opinion. Councilmember O'Kane, you had something else? Okay. Yes, Mr. City Manager. I was talking to a nearby city manager the other day and uh, she feels like she's the one to blame for all these variants. And what I mean by that is anytime she says, okay, we're going back in person, a new variant pops up. And so she was, uh, she and her council were ready to go back to in person in January, but now Omicron's here and now she's kind of backing off that. Um, so the cities, um, I haven't formally polled everybody, but my sense is that most of the cities around us are still 100% Zoom. Um, I know Woodenville's meeting in person and somebody told me that Mill Creek is meeting in person. Um, I didn't, I'd love to pick the brain of the Woodenville city manager. I haven't had a chance to yet, but just to find out all about all their logistics and things. We were going to have a, a mock in-person council meeting. We were hoping before tonight's meeting, but we ran into some scheduling issues. And I think we're going to try to have that mock meeting, um, next or later this week, but yeah, just some more operational things to consider. So you've talked about masks. And then mask enforcement. So um, I was watching a Walla Walla City Council meeting where they're hybrid and you know they're in person and and they they mentioned that at a previous meeting they had to adjourn the meeting because people in the audience weren't wearing masks and wouldn't leave. And so 
their only option, I guess, was just to adjourn adjourn the meeting. I guess the other option is to forcibly remove them, but that would make for lots of YouTube hits. Um, so um, the other thing to consider is, do you as a city council want to socially distance um, at the dais? I've been watching in-person meetings and I haven't seen any social distancing among council members, but they're all wearing masks. Um, another thing to consider is screen management. And I, I think that's easy. I think we can figure it out, but I've seen a couple cities show you how not to do it. Um, like for example, they'll have one council member online and they take up half the, the, the one council member takes up half the screen and then the council's at the dais. And so you have six tiny little council members with masks on and then one large head and you can't tell who's speaking. Um, so, but I, but Pierce County Council, I think they've got it nailed down. They, they have the council dais screen as the pinned screen. And so they, they make sure they just always show that screen. And if, if somebody has, if there's a presenter, they'll let the presenter show their screen. But so there's things like that that need to be worked out. Um, uh, Council Member Marshall said that in his work, uh, one thing they're doing is the judge and others that are, you know, they're, they're having the Zoom in person uh, combo. And uh, Council Member Marshall, you might explain this better than me, but my understanding is that you can, you can log in on Zoom as your own account, have your, your picture, but then mute everything, mute your mic, mute your speaker, and then when you talk, it'll come over the microphone, but you're not getting the double feedback. Um, Council Mar Member Marshall, is that accurate? Did I explain that correctly? Yeah, that is it. Yeah, and then also when the zoom in, especially for uh, defendants, then the the image appears, person's face appears. They turn on the video and their audio, and and they're up there. And then there's still people in the courtroom: the judge, the clerk, the attorneys. Yeah. As for vaccine mandate, yeah, we would like some policy direction from you on whether to mandate it for attendees or whether just to mandate it just for yourselves. Um, if it's for attendees, I would like to um, find out from other cities if they're requiring vaccines for attendees and what enforcement and, and monitoring looks like. So uh, I'd, I'd want to do a little bit of homework and call around and ask other cities what they're doing. So those are some of the operational issues. All right, anything else on the, on the topic? Council member file. Thank you. I would want to have partition separations between, you know, the, like the clear plastic partition separation between um, council members and hopefully staff to, to help keep everybody safe if we re-entered the public space um, in the council chambers. Um, and, you know, I, I believe that King County did a, a legal assessment of vaccine mandate versus, um, you know, option with testing. And I think we should have our attorney look at that and see what we can learn from it. Um, I think it's important um, that, we consider people of differences, whether they have medical underlying um, issues uh, and cannot be vaccinated or religious issues um, and and request uh, and require, you know, testing 24 hours beforehand. I, I'm all for um, supporting a required vaccination of counsel. Um, and I'd be happy to show my card <laughs> anytime. Um, but I, I just think we have to be responsible and I think we have to be accommodating and our state um, legal system has kind of set a framework for um, it, addressing people's needs and differences. Um, as We're still working hard to keep this concise, so let's let's try to do that. Thank you, uh, Councilmember Kugler. Thank you. Um, I agree with 
many of the points that council member O'Kane made. I just wanted to mention that, I mean, I think if we meet in person, I would want us all to be wearing masks. We need to. And I think it's not ideal being in talking behind the mask and people can't see us. But um, I think that issue of logistically having that simultaneous auto, audio is going to be maybe an operational challenge that we're going to have to tackle at some point in time. Like when we're ready to go in, I think we're still going to have to make that work. And I think the previous system that the council used prior to COVID is not going to work. So it might be worth us just testing. And, you know, we're, we're kind of kicking this down the curb for now, but we're going to have to tackle that, I think, in a different way. So we, we may want to start um, experimenting sooner rather than later. Right. Yes, Mr. City Manager. I wholeheartedly agree. And uh, so I think a little bit later this week, we're going to experiment. And then um, I am recommending, and I think you agree with me, that we are going to have the retreat on January 8th, Saturday, in person at City Hall. We'll, we'll spread out and everything, but we're going to try to have the retreat in person unless you tell me otherwise. But I think what I'm hearing is that other than the retreat, you want to just stay on Zoom for a while um, and not do it right at the beginning, not go back in person at the beginning of the year. And kind of my feeling, because we don't know with Omicron exactly what we're up against yet, I, I'm not so much in favor of having the retreat in person. Mm -hmm. But that's just my opinion. Yeah, give me some direction on that too. Yeah. Anyway. I, I would actually like direction on that too. <laughs> yeah, we, we can certainly do that. Deputy Mayor? Councilman Rokane was before me. As, as much as I would like to meet in person for the treat, and I, I could go either way, but if, if there's council members, if there's a consensus or majority, I can go with it on a Zoom retreat. Um, I, I think we were effective last year. I mean, I do, I do love being in person though. I mean, it does, there's a benefit, but at the same time, it's a meeting just like this. Okay. The same things count. Deputy Mayor? I mean, I was going to say, I think it's hard to really forecast out even four weeks kind of where things yeah. are going because things keep. But unless we know more. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's 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 just hard to figure out if in four right. weeks we're going to feel like we can sit in a room together for eight hours straight and feel uh, OK about it. Councilmember Shrebnik. Yeah, I would, I would suggest that the retreat presents more risk than the meetings, actually, because if we're going to be yeah. taking off masks where it's longer exposure time as well, um, I and I also don't feel like it's um, fair, so to speak, to privilege us to um, meet together when we're not doing willing, willing to do that for the public. Um, so I yeah, I would prioritize meeting with the public before I would prioritize meeting a person with us. Even though I well, love it, make, oh, we do. <laughs> let's make sure we all get to the city manager with our opinions on this. Um, all right, nothing new on this topic. Then um, this is a special meeting. That's it. So um, okay. let's. Can I, can I just recap? I just want to be, be crystal clear yep. on the direction I'm getting. So sure. I'm hearing 100% uh, Zoom for the retreat and 100% Zoom into January. And we'll we'll reassess in January and see what we wanna do. Uh, I would like a minimum of a few weeks notice before we go online, because we need time to work out bugs and stuff. Sure. So, okay, so we're assuming 100% so assuming Zoom for the foreseeable future. Yeah, I was, um, I hear that the plan at King County is to give six weeks notice before they're going back to in-person and they don't know when that will be at this point, but. All right, uh, December 13th, regular meeting, December uh, 14th, special legislative delegation send off event and December 20th, a special and regular meeting. And with that, Mr. City Manager, just note that on the December 13th meeting, it is actually a special meeting. We're having a 620 exec session. On okay, so it's not a special meeting. It's a re it's not a regular meeting. It's a special meeting. That's right. Okay, we need to correct that in the uh, 
in the oh. agenda. All right. Six six twenty start time special meeting on December thirteenth. All right. Thank you, everybody. Have a great evening. <laughs>